Good evening and welcome to another edition of Resource PNG. Tonight we speak to Greg Anderson, the Executive Director of the Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, John Gooding, the Managing Director and CEO of Highlands Pacific Limited, and Peter Taylor, the Chairman of Bougainville Copper Limited. But first we speak to Greg Anderson about the Chamber's reasons behind facilitating the first Mining and Safety Conference in PNG. Greg Anderson, thank you for joining us on Resource PNG. Thank you for inviting me. The um, Mine Occupational Health and Safety uh, Conference, the first of its kind that has been organized by the Chamber. Uh, could you give us some background about what the thinking was behind the conference? Well, I guess it's probably a bit overdue in many ways. We've done a number of dedicated conferences and focused on community affairs, environment, and over the years, and of course the technical issues. Whilst health and safety has come out very much in the, in the technical conferences because it's been a, an enormous focus for both mining and petroleum for quite a long time now, we haven't done a dedicated conference and it was felt that it was long overdue and, and uh, hence we've, we've, um, we've launched it and we've had a good, good response so we're very pleased. One of the focuses on, of the conference obviously is employee health. Um, Obviously, the industry is going through a downturn and many employees might be having concerns about their jobs and all this stuff. Now, <clears throat> from the industry perspective, uh, what sort of policy support do you uh, expect from the government given this downturn in commodity prices and the problems, for example, Barrick is having with, for example, the 5.5 uh, billion write-down of the Pascualama uh, project in Chile, and then you have Newcrest with its five, uh, six billion dollar write down as well. So, what what are you looking at the government for at the moment? Well, if we could just step back a bit, mm. I think it's important to realise that uh, we've we've had a, a nearly a decade of of uh, rising conditions and and very vibrant conditions in both mining and petroleum. What's happened in the last nine months or so is that there's a divergence opened up between the two sectors and, and oil and gas is still, certainly in the PNG context, is doing very well. As we know, we're getting an LNG project completed and we've got very good chances of adding to that project and building further uh, oil and gas projects, further, further LNG projects and further other types of uh, projects. Mining is in the world context, and we know different is extremely stressed at the moment, particularly in the in the junior sector where the markets have dried up, so to speak. That's become very difficult for explorers to raise finance on on the main markets across the world. And uh, exploration, of course, is uh, a company doesn't make any money; it just spends money, high risk money, and and they ne you need to be able to go to the uh, uh, equity markets to raise money, the, the, the risk mar markets to raise that money required for exploration. And uh, the markets have turned, turned against the, 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 the mining sector, exploration sector. So it's become very difficult and people are, are under a lot of stress. A lot of the smaller companies are, um, are facing difficulties, the explorers. Hand in hand with that, as you pointed out, a number of our producers and worldwide producers, people have faced a lot of stresses now too because there's, there's been too much focus in the industry on production, that's been recognised now, and, and ounces, as, they say, as we say, rather than the costs of production. And of course in the Australian sector, as we know, the costs of production have gone up enormously and that's also affected us quite a lot. So some of the, our, our producers are also facing difficult times and they've got to get the uh, costs down on operations so that they uh, become profitable. Yeah, you know, speaking about costs, the government is reviewing taxation uh, and uh, how might that impact on cost of doing business in Papua New Guinea? Yes, well that uh, <coughs> flows on, as you'll point out, because uh, when an industry where an industry is under difficult times, uh, having having tax reviews and so on can, can put further stress on, and and uh, we hope the government will recognise this that the that the industry is facing some difficult times, and uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. Same with uh, other reviews, like we're doing uh, 
pointed out this morning by the Secretary, there's a, a, a comprehensive review going on the Mining Safety Act and that's uh, a review, a, a part of a much wider review on all the legislation in mining, including the Mining Act. And the same, we have tried to project the same message there that a, a review of your Mining Act also has to take into, a, into account that this might be for the next 15 years or so, that that has to take these cycles into account. And you have some good times and you have your bad times. And it's very important to remember that it was the review of the taxation uh, in which we uh, can, had a part in persuading government, so to speak, in the early 2000s that, uh, that the industry, our, our tax regime had come, become uh, uncompetitive on a worldwide basis. The government took, uh, took that on board and, and changed the tax regime uh, to become more competitive, and which took effect on the first of the first 2003, and we took off, so to speak, because that that happened by luck to 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 uh, coincide with the commodity price rise, and and we delivered, uh, and and it's been a very good partnership with government for 10 years or so, and we've delivered to to um, mining projects. Uh, on the way and, and of course an LNG project. We'll be back with more of this interview after the break. The Chamber of Mines and Petroleum is in support of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative EITI. Greg Anderson now tells us the role the Chambers will be playing with regard to formulating policy. On the, uh, the benefits that have flown into the, uh, from the resources sector, oil and uh, mining, there, there's a lot of community concern about where, where the, those benefits go, particularly from the government and from uh, the landowner organizations. The Chamber is supporting the uh, EITI, the Ex Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Uh, what, what role do you think the Chamber might play within the uh, institutional framework if, if there is, or would you support, what support will you provide in terms of formulating policy? <clears throat> well, it's a very important issue to us, CITI, and We've been a strong supporter of it for a number of years, publicly, the Chamber. And uh, the government, uh, there's been a lot of work going on in the last uh, two years or so between the different st stakeholder groups because EITI is, is driven by the stakeholder groups, which is government, uh, civil society and industry. And as you probably know, the, the Treasurer recently went to the international, the global EITI conference in Sydney and announced that uh, PNG would be lodging its membership by the end of the year. So there's now a lot of work going on in putting what's called the uh, multi-stakeholder group with those three parties uh, have, have uh, representatives on theirs so that uh, once we become member, we, we can do all the preliminary work now, we have to have a memorandum of agreement and, and operating principles, etc. Then the whole thing will be launched uh, starting starting January to actually commence the process. What, one of the criticisms of the EIT, I do, but is that the industry, uh, particularly uh, publicly listed companies, are already providing the information about how much money they give to the government and to uh, other stakeholders in the companies. And the EITI would just be a additional paperwork for those companies. Um, does the industry in Papua New Guinea have similar concerns or not? <laughs> Well, that's, that's a fair point. That's a point that we did raise early on in the process, that the, it, it would be uh, valuable if the EITI requirements fitted into to, uh, existing requirements to supply data. But that's not our prime concern. We want the process to work properly. Everybody in the community has a right to know what uh, we are providing in, in taxes and so on, as indeed with other major industries, I believe. To, to the government and, and uh, to match that up with what the government receipts are, which is what EITI is all about, have it audited by an independent group and then so and available to the public. And PNG already has a very good record in terms of mining uh, and petroleum in, in data being available. 
It's nothing has really been secret. It's just getting it for the average person. You now this report and that report and that government bit and that government. This will put it in a concise form for anyone to get access to and that will be one of the big challenges, making it available to anyone in the public also once, you've, once it's there. Now just looking forward, as you've highlighted, um, <clears throat> PNG now, if you like, has a two-speed resource sector with the mining on a, on a downturn mm. at the moment and petroleum looking good. Um, when do you think things would even out uh, in the short or medium well, or long term? We, ex we uh, <coughs> uh, expect all our, pro our projects are going through critical reviews and, and, and looking at costs and so on. Uh, and we expect them to all come, go forward strongly in the future. But it's difficult to know exactly where the markets are going to go in terms of expiration money and uh, uh, where, where share prices are going to go. A lot of p people have low share prices at the moment and so on. It's, it's, it's very uncertain. But uh, I think we're going to face a few difficulties in the next 12 months. Mr Anderson, thank you for joining thank us on Russell's PNG. We'll be back with more after the break. You're back with Resource PNG. The Frida River project located on the border of West Sipic and East Sipic provinces is one of the largest undeveloped copper and gold deposits in the Asia-Pacific region. Currently, a feasibility study is underway and production isn't anticipated until 2018. Here's John Gooding, the Managing Director and CEO of Highlands Pacific Limited, to talk about the current progress with the Frida River project as well as other ventures the company is involved in. Mr. Gooding, welcome to Resource PNG. Thank you, Martin. We begin with uh, the Frida River situation. Your partner, Glencore Extrata, has done a feasibility study. And could you inform us on the progress on that? Yes, I can, I can do that, Martin. Um, we, we have been in a joint venture with Extrata <coughs> up until the end of um, 2011 when Extrata were due to uh, provide us with a feasibility study. So they, they paid for all that and free carried Highlands. It was our project originally. Um, they've spent, they spent about $280 million on it, US dollars. Um, at the end of 2011, we were concerned that, um, that the execution model hadn't been optimised properly, so they didn't look at some of the things that we wanted them to look at. So during 2012, um, we agreed to, uh, or Extrata agreed to provide more information for the feasibility study. Um, and at the end of 2012, um, we received that documentation. Um, we still believe in, in Extrata by their own um, um, admission that there needs more work to be done yet. So we think there's probably another year's work to be done yet. Um, in the meantime, there's been a takeover. Glencore have, and Extrata have merged and um, Glencore have made it quite obvious that they uh, don't want to develop uh, Greenfields projects uh, and that includes Frida River and Tampakan and they have also reached agreement with the Chinese authorities, um, Ministry of Finance, when they're doing the merger um, agreement to um, offload some of their assets. So, uh, as we understand it, they're um, in the process of looking at offloading Frida River. Or their so, share so, of Frida so, does River. that mean that you might potentially have a Chinese partner in Frida River? Um, look, I, I guess that could be on the cards, um, uh, and, and we hope to find out shortly because um, uh, we do have a preemptive right over the remainder of the equity in, in Frida River and um, we at least think that we'll be notified who a potential purchaser might be. Um, uh, I guess that the, the, the Chinese party could be interested in it. I mean, it's a wonderful project. Yeah. No, the, the project itself has <coughs> taken decades to come to feasibility stage and uh, now we're everyone's sort of anticipating construction. Well, how, how far ahead are we looking oh, again look, I, for that? Well, as I said earlier, the, there needs to be more work done. Um, and we believe that probably a year or 18 months, 
more feasibility work. Technical work, design work needs doing uh, to firm up costs. Um, but you know, you'd still like to think that it could be producing in 2018. One of the difficulties as, as noted by the feasibility studies has been the uh, energy requirements. Uh, now, <clears throat> there's been talk, talk around of potentially getting it from Western Province, Stanley, and then mm -hmm. uh, via the Octedi uh, route over to Frida River. Has that been uh, factored in? Um, look, there, there are two options that are being looked at at the moment. One is a hydroelectric dam. Um, this, this project will need about 200 megawatts of power, a lot of power. Um, yeah, I think the PNG national requirement is currently at 54 megawatts, so that's quite yeah, massive. Yeah, right, yeah. So, so the original um, uh, proposal was to build a hydroelectric power station. Uh, since the development of the Stanley Field, um, it seems to make a lot of sense that we utilise PNG's resources. Um, you know, the land landholders will get something out of it, the government will get something out of it, and it's in close proximity to, to, to Booble. Octedi, um, you know, the Western Province, which is developing, so um, that's certainly an option that that has been looked at and will be developed further. Now, just along that corridor, you also have some tenements in the Star Mountains that have uh, <coughs> you you're still proving the reserves on. Uh, what what do you think is the potential of of those uh, tenements? Yes, look, um, th those tenements were last drilled with five small drill holes in uh, the very early 70s by Kennecott, who went on to discover Octeti. And so they got a bit distracted after they did that. But um, So we're the first company to drill there since. Um, we have uh, identified a number of porphyry targets and deposits already, uh, one we've put about 14 holes into. We've had some fantastic um, results from those drill holes. Uh, we've just recently, or at the start of this year, finished um, a, a hole at Kumkum, which was about five kilometres away. So we're definitely in a porphyry district, a new porphyry district. Um, unfortunately, due to um, fuel supplies and um, river heights and things at the start of the year, we had to wind back our program. And, and with the market the way it is, um, we've, we've stopped drilling at the moment, but our gear is all still ready to start again um, when the time is appropriate and um, in the meantime we're just looking at all that work but the potential sorry for, but the potential for those deposits to provide feed for Octeti is very high we'll have more of this interview after the break Thanks for staying with us on the show. We continue the interview with John Gooding, the Managing Director and CEO of Highlands Pacific Limited. So we, we, we talk about your other project, Ramonico. Um, are you quite satisfied with the work that has been done in terms of the uh, production and the work that your uh, mm. Chinese partner has been uh, performing down at uh, the Ramonico project? Yes, look, th this project, again, that was a Highlands project. Uh, we brought in well, in, with the government, um, Ramu Nickel, to develop the project and finance it. Um, they've done a very good job building it and um, they've had huge obstacles, you know, with the location and, the, and, and all the different um, challenges they've, they've had to face, including a two-year court case. Um, so unfortunately the project is about uh, two or three years behind time when it should be producing. Um, we are quite satisfied with the, with the way it's been going, but we're getting um, a little bit impatient. We would like to see production reach the nameplate capacity um, earlier than what we think it might now. Um, uh, at the moment, they're at about 30, 40% nameplate capacity. So when do you think uh, your levels of production will go up to, I think it's 10,000? tonnes per annum that's supposed uh, 30, to be... 31,000 31, tonnes of yeah. um, contained nickel per annum is the target <coughs> and um, uh, we're just finalising that with our partners at the moment but um, uh, I think it might be sometime next year now. Uh, uh, certainly the, the target that we had for the, the end of this year at nameplate capacity rate um, as I, I think will be a challenge at the moment. 
Now, given, given those production challenges and the drop in the price of nickel, um, when do you think will the project at least make some money? <coughs> well, with these types of projects, very large fixed costs. So it's all about volume. And the yeah. sooner we can get up to nameplate capacity or to, say, 70 or 80 per cent nameplate capacity, the better. Um, and until that time, um, it won't be... Um, making any money really, um, we we don't and we haven't nominated yet. We we can actually um, determine when we're going to become involved with the project. And at the moment, during this commissioning phase, um, we are we're not part of the project per se. We you know, we intend when the project gets to about eighty percent capacity to um, to look at then becoming involved and in sharing production costs. And getting revenue from the project. I suppose Highland Pacific story is also reflected in the uh, drop in the <coughs> share price. Um, just looking in the medium to long term, what, what is the potential that Highland Pacific have? Well, um, who knows? Look, the, the whole market has been um, in, a, in a big downfall uh, in the last three months, in, in three or four months anyway. Um, I was looking at some numbers the other day and I think um, you know, something like um, 80% of, no, 50% of companies have had, resource companies have had share price drops of more than 80% um, since their highs over the last couple of years. So everyone's in the same boat. Um, having said that, um, the market is picking up a little bit. I think sentiment with um, the US is, is becoming more positive. I think um, you know, with the election looming in Australia, I think our uh, domestic retail market is probably becoming a bit more confident, so um, you know the market is starting to pick up a bit. You know, just finally, I suppose this downturn reflects that cyclical nature of these uh, commodities boom and bust. Uh, PNG has recently had a pretty much good uh, trend over the past decade, and then now we're seeing this slump. Um, and in the meantime, somehow the governments decided. That we're going to do a review of tax, uh, taxation regimes. And what are your thoughts about uh, what sort of policy uh, support that the government needs to provide to the industry at, yes, at this current yeah. downturn? Look, I think um, the O'Neill government is giving the resource industry great support. Um, it, it's unfortunate the world markets have, have dropped a bit, but I think that's been a wake-up call for a lot of companies operating, not just in PNG, but everywhere just to look at their cost structures and the way they do things. Um, so uh, I see that as a positive because at my age I've been through many of these cycles and, mm -hmm. um, and when it goes down it will come back up again. It's just a matter of when. But So um, now the government's support for the mining industry, resource industry in PNG is important. Um, I think it needs to understand that um, it is very expensive building resource projects here in PNG um, just due to the lack of infrastructure and uh, and the government's certainly determined to try and improve that and, uh, and of course the uh, the benefits to the country are immense it's still the the best industry to take PNG forward uh, and, and assist with developing health and education all those things that come with developing projects. Mr Gooding thank you for joining us. Thank you. We join Peter Taylor when we return. The oldest existing mine in PNG is the Bougainville Copper Mine, which began production in 1972, but due to conflict has been shut down for the last 24 years. In our next interview, we talk to Peter Taylor, the chairman of Bougainville Copper Limited, and find out what negotiations are underway with the autonomous Bougainville government to reopen the mine. Peter Taylor, thank you for joining us on Resource PNG. Thank you for having me. Now we begin with Bougainville. It's been 24 years since Panguna has been shut down and in recent times there has been growing interest on the island by the autonomous government and the people of Bougainville about reopening Panguna. What is BCL's view on the progress that's happening regarding Panguna? Well, it, it is very exciting for Bougainville Copper. The 
the um, support we're getting from the community for the reopening of the mine has just increased tremendously in recent times. So it's, it's quite exciting actually, the prospect of actually getting the mine opened again in the, in the not too distant future. I understand negotiations between BCL and the autonomous government are progressing well. You've recently had meetings with them. At what stage are the negotiations? We've been meeting with the government for some years now, but the process is becoming more formal and more inclusive. We've now got um, landowner groups, representatives attending the meetings. Uh, we've got uh, representatives, ex-combatants attending the meetings. We've got representatives of the national government attending. So it's, it's fairly inclusive these days. And uh, the meetings are help being held rather regularly. And I've got to say the progress is very encouraging. Now, with regards to the government, what, what is BCL's feeling about the way ABG has approached the resumption of mining on the island? The, the ABG has been very supportive and very helpful. Um, the, the government and President Momus have made it very clear to everybody that the, they see uh, the economy of Bougainville in the short to medium term being very dependent on a major project like the mine ring opening. You've also mentioned that Panguna landowners have come to the table to uh, have talks with BCL and the ABG. What sort of discussions are you having with the landowners? Well, firstly, uh, the inclusion of the landowners has been a, a long-term uh, requirement as far as BCL is concerned in starting negotiations because without the landowners and the landowners being full participants, there's not much point really in taking the matter much further. Uh, the Bougainville government has been very helpful in um, getting the, together their various landowner groups and they've now formed, the landowners have now formed a combined group and elected themselves a chairman. So they're now full participants in the negotiations that we've been having. These are early days, we're still working out in effectively the agenda we need, we agreed between all of the parties to follow. Um, we will initially be looking at some studies to uh, look at the, the environmental questions, the uh, s social issues in the mine area, um, what needs to be done in terms of community development. We'll, uh, we'll get round to talking about compensation, which, is, which has been an issue for some time. So there are a range of matters, but as I said, it's reasonably early days, uh, but the progress has been really good. What sort of time frame do you see these talks to take, you know, decades or a few years? Well, certainly I hope it's not decades. Uh, my hair's grey enough already without <laughs> it getting greyer. But the, um, look, the progress, the way the progress is going at the, at the moment, it, it, it's not impossible that we won't have uh, worked out um, some form of agreement by the end of this year. That might be a little bit optimistic, but we've, we're certainly starting to get down to some of the important issues. One can't estimate the, shouldn't underestimate the, um, the complexity in the negotiations. For example, we have to work out uh, legally what the mining regime might, might be, uh, land ownership issues which are on the agenda, obviously the technical issues, the environmental issues. There are just so many things that need to be worked out and we'll have to uh, have a number of study groups going. Um, so m it may be a little optimistic to expect an outcome by the end of the year, but certainly I think we'll have made quite a bit of progress by then. Obviously the complexity of the situation is reflected also in the diversity of the views being expressed, both for and against the resumption of large-scale mining on Bougainville given the history. Um, what's, what, what sort of things are you hearing from the communities? Uh, what's happening now? is typical of what happens when a new development, the mining development starts. Um, the community obviously has concerns about what the project will mean for them, um, what, uh, what the downsides might be, what the upsides uh, should be, and uh, without the upsides uh, being greater than the downsides, maybe they, they don't want the project to go ahead. And you will get a range of views and you expect it. I mean, I'd be worried if everybody was saying this is wonderful. Um, we need to know what the people's concerns are so we can address them. So I encourage people to come forward and say uh, what they think might be a problem for them in respect of reopening the mine. Um, but by and large, there, well at least in this case there's been some experience. Some experiences that we've had in the past haven't been good but some have been wonderful. For example, take the training facility we had at Bougainville Copper 
when the mine was operating, it was probably the best training facility, technical training facility in the Pacific outside of Australia and New Zealand. So that there's those positives, there's health uh, centres, there's educational facilities, uh, there are community facilities like uh, reticulated clean water, electricity, all of those things we will be looking at in addition to just the mine operation itself. One of your recent announcements was the support that you are giving to media on Bougainville. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, well that's being done through the Bougainville Copper Foundation, of which I'm also chairman. Um, uh, Bougainville Copper Foundation has been largely funded by Bougainville Copper uh, since its foundation. But we think it's very important both at BCL and in the foundation for, for all of the people of Bougainville to have access to information um, about the, the mine reopening obviously, but just generally. They need to understand um, you know, what their government is doing, what the national government is doing with respect to Bougainville. They need to know, for example, you know, issues concerning uh, the possibility of the upcoming referendum on independence. So um, at the moment, uh, the, the, the facilities for radio transmission are largely confined to the Booker area. Uh, of course, you can get shortwave radio and so on, but uh, for local radio, what we've decided to do through the Bougainville Copper Foundation is upgrade radio reception to all of Bougainville and we'll be doing that through, uh, at this stage we're proposing to do that through satellite. Stay tuned for more after this break. Welcome back. We continue the interview with Peter Taylor, the chairman of Bougainville Copper Limited. You've just mentioned an interesting thing about the referendum and information about referendum, but in terms of BCL's view about Bougainville's implica uh, independence and the implication that it might have on mining uh, rules and regulations, what what is uh, BCL's what sort of negotiations BCL is having with the uh, autonomous government about? Bougainville's future in terms of mining and BCL's role in that? Well, the, um, it, these are important questions, of course, because uh, we, have to we have to know what the legal regime is going to be like before we can make a decision on committing uh, rather large sums of money to redevelop. Uh, but the Bougainville government's been very uh, engaging in terms of consulting with, with BCL on its proposed legislation in the mining area. Um, we haven't, uh, they haven't concluded their mining act at this stage. It's still uh, being negotiated vis-a-vis -vis Bougainville Copper anyway. Um, and it may be, uh, and I don't want to preempt what the government ultimately does, but it may be that Bougainville Copper will stand aside from other mining legislation because there is already in place the Bougainville Copper Agreement, which is under national government legislation. And it will take, by doing it that way, it will take away some complexity in getting the General Mining Act up and running, as opposed to the specifics that apply under the Special Mining Lease, which has been issued by the National Government. But as I say, we're, we're, we're in discussions with the Bougainville Government on that very issue. They've invited us to make submissions and we've taken that offer up. At the recent annual report meeting that BCL had, you highlighted some uh, methods of waste disposal uh, in terms of uh, if the mine were to reopen and you've also highlighted that the cost that might be involved is quite large, about five billion. Um, just thinking about this, what time frame do you think the mine could perhaps be redeveloped if, if it ever is redeveloped? Well the, the actual um, redevelopment stage, the building stage, is likely to take us perhaps three years. But you've got to get to that starting point and that requires an agreement to be reached between all the parties. Then we have to have uh, the, the project permitted. Uh, we have to uh, source equipment and uh, you can't just go and buy one of these enormous bits of equipment that's required, bits, pieces of equipment that are required to run a mine of this size. So there's a lead time that can be one or two years in respect to some equipment. So, you know, you're, you're adding year on year on year, so if it, you know, five or six years is not an unrealistic time frame, I wouldn't have thought. Now, just the last question on Bougainville before I go to talk about the uh, Australia PNG Business Council. Um, 
the issue of compensation is something that's on the minds of many Bougainvilleans who'd be watching on tele national television. Um, recently, the European shareholders uh, have made some comments about what sort of arrangements they would like to see with uh, regards to compensation. What is BCL's view on the issue of compensation? Well, compensation has been an issue for a long time now. The, and I, there are two, I think there are two parts of compensation. Uh, there's the compensation that's claimed in respect of uh, the period during which the mine has been closed to date uh, because there's been no production. I mean, the compensation was was originally based on the mine operating, uh, and, that, and, and that hasn't happened. But nonetheless, the the land that was that the pit now occupies has not been available to the landowner. So we'll, and BCL has made a provision in its accounts for compensation. So we will discuss that with the uh, with the landowners concerned, and uh, we hope we'll work out an amicable solution. Going forward, we need to work out a new compensation regime for when the mine opens, and uh, that might have more elements to it than the original compensation agreement. Uh, we, we are very mindful that it's not just the landowners around the mine that have expectations about what will flow from a development of this kind on Bougainville, so we've got to include all, of Bo all the Bougainvillians. We now have a Bougainville, autonomous Bougainville government, which we didn't have. Um, when the mine formally operated. There was a provincial government, but it didn't have the same powers that this uh, new government has and, and the additional powers we'll have in the future. So it'll be a more inclusive um, and probably more complex compensation arrangement. But, you know, tr the compensation has always been paid in one way or another. In fact, I would say uh, just roughly about 70% of the earnings from Bougainville Copper actually stayed in PNG one way or another. The main complaint that came from the landowners and, and Bougainville more generally was that, that not enough of that 70% found its way back to Bougainvillians or to Bougainville. Uh, that, that aspect will be very different in the future. Now on the issue of Australia PNG trade relations, Kevin Rudd has come recently to the country, his first official visit outside of uh, Australia. What what, what are things looking like? What are prospects for business between business relations between Papua New Guinea and Australia? Well, uh, Papua New Guinea is a very important uh, trading partner for Australia, and I think the Prime Minister emphasised that when he was here. Um, and the trade is increasing, and we, we as a business council hope it continues to increase. Uh, it, PNG is also a very important investment uh, market for Australian businesses. Um, most people think, I suppose, about resource projects, the big ones, and oil and gas. But there are many other smaller businesses that Australians own in Papua New Guinea. And we also encourage Papua New Guineans to invest in Australia. We see the two-way trade needs to be increased between the two countries. So um, it's, it's very timely for the Prime Minister to come to Papua New Guinea. There is, in fact, a new trade minister in Australia now, Richard Miles. And oh, Richard yeah. Miles is well known to many Papua New Guineans because he was parliamentary secretary for the Pacific and he has a particular interest in Papua New Guinea. So I think it's a, it's, it's a very uh, fortuitous that he should now be the trade minister and I'm hoping and I'm sure Richard will uh, do what he can to increase that trade between Australia and Papua New Guinea. You, you've mentioned one thing about the link between the resource sector and uh, Australian uh, suppliers who supply the resources sector, you yourself being part of the sector, is, you're seeing a downturn, particularly in the mining sector. What impact might that have on uh, trade links between uh, PNG and uh, Australia, particularly in relation to suppliers to the resources sector? I think Papua New Guinea uh, <coughs> showed just how robust its mining industry was during the global financial crisis. Uh, there weren't too many economies in the world that either stayed on an even keel or their economies actually expanded. Papua New Guinea was one of them. And uh, when you look at the, the uh, commodities that P&G produces, I think that's the answer. I mean, gold, uh, you know, even at $1,200 or $1,300 or $1,400 an ounce is still a pretty good price compared to what it used to be. Copper prices are high. Uh, you have very, uh, very desirable commodities like oil and gas that the international uh, markets want. So um, there are still plans for mining projects to be developed here in Papua New Guinea, where in other places they're either being put on hold or just cancelled. So I still think there is a very bright future for, the, for PNG in the resources sector. 
and um, as resource, uh, as major resource developments are built, that also then opens the way for other smaller businesses, as, as you've said, uh, support, the, support the mining industry. And it's those smaller businesses uh, where the opportunities are for P&G investors, uh, for uh, small and medium-sized companies from Australia to get involved in, and, uh, and they are the big employers, and that's very important, increasing uh, employment opportunities for Papua New Guineans. Peter Taylor, thank you for joining us on Resource PNG. Thank you. That ends this edition of Resource PNG. If you have any comments or queries, do email us on this address, resourcepng at mtv.com.pg. Or to find out more, check MTV online. That's www.mtv.com.pg. And go to our Resource PNG page, or you can check our page on Facebook. Until the same time next week, Bye for now.